100 years ago, there were more electrics on the road than there were gas cars. My great-grandfather, Andrew L. Riker, was an early American automotive pioneer. By the age of 20, he had about 20 patents already to his name. It's a big fight going on right now, and the oil companies have a lot of money to put into this fight. The electric vehicle is not for everybody. It can only meet the needs of 90% of the population. I drive a real car, and I uh, find that it's not a toy at all. The people were not going to wait around to have the solution delivered to them. Production of immense possibilities is made possible by the generous support of the Earth and Humanity Foundation. Wendy Selden. Rogue Co-ops, a community-centered collaboration among the Ashland Food Co-op, the Grange Co-op, Rogue Credit Union, and the Medford Food Co-op. Cliff Bar and Company. Elizabeth York and these additional members of the Immense Possibilities Community Builders Circle. Welcome to our weekly visit with people who are creating immense possibilities for healthy communities, solutions to all kinds of challenges. There are very few communities and really very few people whose lives aren't powerfully shaped by automobiles. The convenience and ease and pleasures they afford us can sometimes obscure the costs we pay for our dependence on them. One sign that the thrill was leaving our love affair with cars was a surprisingly popular 2006 documentary that sounded something like a murder mystery. In 1996, electric cars began to appear on roads all over California. They were quiet and fast, produced no exhaust, and ran without gasoline. Ten years later, these futuristic cars were almost entirely gone. What happened? Why should we be haunted by the ghost of the electric car? There's still a, roughly a trillion barrels worth of oil in the Earth's crust. That's a hundred trillion dollars worth of business yet to be done. The electric vehicle is not for everybody. It can only meet the needs of 90% of the population. Who killed the electric car? Lack of corporate wisdom. Uh, in my opinion, it's, it's big oil. The murder was committed by the General Motors company. What's interesting, you're going to be shredding some new cars. Why are you shredding them up? A little bit of a mystery, really. Well, that seems like a shame. As you probably noticed the electric car didn't stay dead and it's not off on the fringes of America's automotive landscape just a plaything for rich people and eccentric gearheads electric cars are back in a big way and that's one important thing that our first guest wants you to know they are James Stevens who helped start the Southern Oregon Electric Vehicle Association and Patrick Box an electronic technician who's converted several gasoline cars to electric. Gentlemen, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thanks. Nice to be here. James, you are focused and determined in a, in a big way to move more electric vehicles into the mainstream of the American landscape. Why is that? Well, it's really time for it. Uh, the electric vehicle that 15 years ago was literally crushed because the big auto manufacturers thought this just isn't a good business model. Uh, you have all of the major manufacturers uh, actually required to uh, get more fuel mileage than they ever have before, so they're using electrics to augment this. You have other manufacturers that see this as the natural future because it just makes sense. And it's been closed for quite a while. Is it really different this time? Are we really there? You know, I think there's an indicator, and that is if anyone watched the Super Bowl this year, and there were millions of people that did, there were a couple of EV car commercials. BMW and Kia both had major, and these are $2 million a minute commercials for EVs. When the manufacturers are putting that kind of money into it, they're saying it's here, we're ready, and we're going to deliver. Consumers are demanding these new forms of clean energy, clean vehicles. They're really in tune with this, uh, so the, the oil companies can't lay down the rules like they did before.
how are we progressing on the availability of charging stations on the so-called infrastructure so that people can feel secure they're going to find it where they need it? Right. There are level three chargers, uh, the, the length of I-5 from, from Vancouver, B.C., to uh, the Mexican border. There are a lot of places you can charge your car other than just charging stations, but there are uh, easily 50,000 charging stations on the West Coast at this point. Is the, is the private market going to fill this need pretty quickly without any push from government? Oh, I think so, yeah. It, it, it encourages people to come to your store if you have a charging station in front. Uh, rather than the long distance where you go deplete the battery fully and charge in having to wait an hour or two, which no one wants to do on a long trip, everywhere you go there is a place to plug in. So it's the short charging many times to do the whole, uh, whole trip. A lot of people aren't real fans of tax incentives and they'd say, look, it's got a good start. There was some subsidy early on. Let's end the tax incentives and let it sink or swim in the market. What, what would your answer to that be? It will be needed for a while. What we need to get over is the, the initial hump, the investment hump. Uh, so. Well, that means we'll do that if more people buy electric vehicles. Right. And I think you just surprised people by saying they can get into these for twelve to $15,000. What do you think the major hurdle is? you think there's still an idea that these are toy cars, not real cars? Uh, well, I, I drive a real car, and I uh, find that it's not a toy at all. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the misnomer about electrics is they're kind of slow with sluggish. Well, uh, an electric motor has much more torque than uh, many, many uh, gas-powered engines. I, I pull a trailer with my truck, uh, my hybrid truck, and I just leave it in fifth gear and just walk up the hills getting from here to Portland. I drive from here to Portland quite a bit. In fifth gear? In fifth gear, right. I, and it, I can stay at 65 going up hills, no problem, because the electric motor has a lot of torque. Is there any downside to EVs that you gentlemen are slow to tell me about? <laughs> There's another, there's another point I'd like to make about, uh, there's a program called V2G, have you heard of that? It's vehicle to grid. That means that when you plug in your vehicle in the afternoon when you come home from work, the power company can use your battery to even out the, the uh, variations in the, in the voltage caused by wind power and solar power and use your battery to do that. And then it, they st you still end up with a fully charged battery in the morning, they program it. But they it, actually it draws pay you. off your battery right. for a few hours if, maybe, until you get off peak and then you'll recharge? Right, exactly. And they pay, actually pay you money at the end of the year for that. So you can make money on your car being parked in your garage. So it's a charging. little like reverse metering yeah. and solar power right. with exactly. solar panels. James, what can the Southern Oregon Electric Vehicle Association offer to a viewer who's interested in this conversation and really has no background, whatever, in EVs? Come, join us, learn. If you know nothing about electric vehicles, no experience is required. And there are just a lot of people that are there to share the information. If you want to build your uh, electric vehicle or convert uh, like a hybrid uh, vehicle like I did to an electric plug-in, there are people that can do that for you. In purchasing electric vehicles, there are people that can guide you to what's the right fit for your situation. Patrick, what is the personal satisfaction you get out of promoting EVs? Well. Uh, I have grandchildren and children and great-grandchildren, so I want the planet to be here for them. And so reducing carbon is really my big thrust on why I do this. Uh, but it's a lot of fun, too. And what's your reward in being in this work? I'm just having a great time doing this. I believe you. <laughs> James Stevens and Patrick Box are with the Southern Oregon v Electric Vehicle Association. Gentlemen, thank you. Thanks for what you're up to. Thanks for coming to tell us about it. Thanks for having us, Jeff. We appreciate it. Yeah, great time. This is the most secure location uh, that we could find in the building. 
You notice we have plenty of security down here. There's a degree of excitement around electric vehicles we hadn't seen before. We need a lot of people trying a lot of different things, and then we see what emerges. It's a race. It's a total race. You know, until we see every car on the road being electric, we will not stop. These are people who are not going to wait around to have the solution delivered to them. I want to show the world that it's really possible. This is the future, and it's attainable. A principal figure in the films Who Killed the Electric Car and Revenge of the Electric Car is Paul Scott, a pioneer of the modern EV movement and an activist who helped found the national group Plug in America. Paul Scott, welcome to Immense Possibilities. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. The first time I saw you was on the screen in the film Who Killed the Electric Car. What has changed since then to make daylight for EVs? A lot. Uh, first of all, in 2008, the price of gasoline went over $4 a gallon nationally for the very first time, and that devastated the auto industry. Uh, they lost about 40% of their business uh, in one year. So uh, what happened was the auto industry realized they couldn't uh, just maintain building gasoline cars going forward. They had to have an alternative. And so on their own, they started to develop electric cars. And now we have probably 15 different plug-in cars on the market today. Paul, do the periodic drops in oil and gasoline prices pose a problem or a challenge to electric vehicles really getting traction in the market? When the price of gasoline goes up, the sales definitely follow. Uh, but there are still people who will buy electric cars even with a low price of gas because they understand that the price of gas is not going to stay low. And in the long term, it definitely will go up. Are there some people who don't think EVs can perform as well on many dimensions as gasoline cars? Yes, uh, there are a few people I run into who still believe that EVs don't perform well, but they are all people, 100% of them have not driven an electric car. Anybody who's driven one will know that they outperform gasoline cars. You see videos now again with some proud, smiling people charging their cars from the solar panels on their roofs. Is that an odd, eccentric thing to do, or do you think that's going to get more common? It's not an odd at all. <clears throat> I've been doing it for 13 years, and it feels really good. The sun falls on your roof every day, and if you can capture that energy, turn it into electricity, use it to power your house and your car, you're saving thousands of dollars, and you're not polluting at all. So if there, there's a viewer of modest means hearing this and going, this is a rich man's game. This is for affluent people who can buy expensive equipment. What would you say to them? Well, it's not at all. You can buy a used leaf or a used Volt for well under $12,000. That's not a rich man's car. And you can lease solar for zero down. Uh, you can lease a system, save money on the lease itself. So you're, you're actually buying solar energy for less money than your, your grid is offering you. Uh, and it's clean energy. Uh, why wouldn't you do that? You could buy a $12,000 used LEAF and uh, drive it essentially for free. What about the use of electric vehicles for public transportation or collective transportation, larger vehicles? Yeah, so there'll be, uh, in addition to four-passenger purpose-built uh, autonomous cars that are electric, there'll be vans, like 10-passenger vans. Uh, there are already buses here in L.A. They're running electric buses with a 150-mile range that hold, I think, 130 people. Paul, do you have any suggestions for a viewer who would like to play a part in advancing EVs in the market generally, may or may not be in a position to purchase one themselves right now? They can get involved with Plug in America or other organizations that are pushing electric cars. They should be active in local energy generation to make sure people have access to clean, 100% renewable electricity. They should be active in state legislatures, making sure that uh, they don't do what Georgia just did uh, and got rid of their, uh, their tax incentive for electric cars and they're adding a $200 fee to electric cars every year. Uh, so that's, that's going backwards. And Georgia just did that yesterday. So you want to make sure that the 
oil companies don't continue to fight you because it's a big fight going on right now. And the oil companies have a lot of money to put into this fight. There is the argument that there should be an electric car fee because electric cars don't pay a gasoline tax and should share with other vehicles in the cost of maintaining highways. What would you say to that? Well, I would agree with it. Uh, I think that we should wait until electric cars constitute at least one or two percent of total sales. We're just getting started with this. So you don't want to put on an extra tax on a, on a technology that you're trying to encourage. So let's wait a little while before we start doing that. In the meantime, those who think that electric cars need to pay their way, uh, they're all driving gasoline cars, and none of them have ever paid anything for the military, the health, or the environmental cost of their fuel. So they're getting literally hundreds of billions of dollars in subsidy that they're not paying for at all. So I would rather that they put their attention toward that and, and start adding uh, or, or advocating for additional taxes on gasoline to cover those big expenses. Then we can talk about taxing electric cars for road maintenance. Have we cleared all the major hurdles to making EVs a major part of America's motor fleet? Not yet. I'd say in two years when the next generation of electric cars comes out, and these are cars that will go approximately 200 miles on a charge and cost about 35000 retail. Uh, we will hit that within two years, and that's when the sale of electric cars explodes. And everybody in the country who pays attention to cars will understand that electric cars are better than what they're driving, and they will all start flocking to them. What keeps you personally so motivated and so focused all these years, Paul? So I see people dying every day from wars over oil. I see the control over our political process by those who are in the oil industry, coal and natural gas as well. So I fight both these fights. The transportation needs to transition to electric and the grid needs to transition to 100% renewable or as close to it as we can possibly get. And those are the two fights that I, I engage every morning when I wake up. Um, I hate the suffering that I see. I hate what uh, the oil industry has done to our political process. Um, and I'm gonna fight these guys until the day I die. Paul Scott is an EV and alternative energy activist and a co-founder of the national group Plug in America. Paul, thanks for visiting with us on Immense Possibilities. My pleasure. Thank you so much. During the 1890s, electric cars flourished and outsold all other types of cars. 100 years ago, there were more electrics on the road than there were gas cars. For many people, electric cars were the car of choice. Southern Oregon actually has a living link to that old heyday of the electric car. John Crosby is a senior at the Oregon Institute of Technology in Klamath Falls. He converted an old 1986 Toyota Corolla to an electric vehicle. He not only has the aptitude for this work, he actually has the genes. So welcome, John Crosby. Thanks for coming to Immense Possibilities. Thanks for having me. John, tell us who your great-grandfather was. My great-grandfather, Andrew L. Riker, was an early American automotive pioneer. By the age of 20, he had about 20 patents already to his name. And by 1898, he started Riker Electric, building electric vehicles. Most of the vehicles had a top speed of between 20 and 30 miles an hour, and they came in all shapes and sizes. So what happened such that they got brushed aside eventually by gasoline vehicles? Battery technology didn't keep up with mass production and the low cost of gasoline. So do you think your, your lineage had anything to do with nudging you to an interest in EVs? You know, it wasn't until after my first year in college that I really took an interest in electric vehicles. When you converted an old Toyota. Was that just a massive major project? Was it frustrating? Was it mostly fun? How did it go? Now, the purpose of my car was to have completed one conversion of my own so that I could demonstrate that I was capable of it and figure out what the challenges would be in starting a company. It took a couple years to finish the conversion, but with the help of some locals, uh, support of my family, and a lot of 
thinking and talking to other people that have converted vehicles, I finally got it running uh, just in time for me to move up to Oregon. So there were a lot of challenges, but one thing that you'll get from anybody that rides an electric vehicle is the electric vehicle grin. And uh, when I first took it out and went down the road and came back, I couldn't have been happier. When you drive an electric vehicle, one that's roadworthy, uh, you know, not just stuck to the golf course, uh, it's just a whole different experience. And it's something that until you've done it yourself, it's, it's hard to explain. Do you think EVs have a really big potential market among people of your age, maybe larger than among their parents? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's still a little bit of a new trend. I mean, gas vehicles, there's still a lot of aspects that make them more accessible because of cost. But the cost of driving electric and the freedom that it actually gives you once you know where to charge is just something that is sort of unparalleled. Instead of spending all your money on fuel as you're traveling, you can go out to eat an extra time or you can go and buy some things at the local shop you're visiting. Do you see a lot of career paths in this industry going forward, even for some people who may not be completely technologically focused? There's going to be a lot of jobs just in seeking out which technology will be the one that we go with in the end. Uh, and then once that happens, I think so many people will be using electric vehicles that the industry of autom the automotive industry is pretty well going to be replaced from gasoline to electric. What do you see yourself doing 10 years from now, John? Well, hopefully I will be driving a state-of-the-art electric vehicle that I have built. <laughs> uh, but uh, I also hope to be working with as many people as possible and getting them into electric vehicles. Is there anything you want to be sure our viewers know about electric vehicles before we wrap this up? Before you make an opinion of electric vehicles, take a ride in one or go drive one. John Crosby is a senior at OIT. He has built his own electric vehicle and uh, probably not for the last time. John, thank you for visiting with us on Immense Possibilities. Appreciate it. Thank you. It was fun.
That's it for this edition of Immense Possibilities. You can find out more or send us suggestions at immensepossibilities.org or visit our Facebook page and like and share us there. Thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Golden. Until next time, please do what you can do. Thanks for watching to learn about tonight's immense possibility. You can watch any of our past programs anytime at immensepossibilities.org.